Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Apostle Paul says in Romans, the first chapter, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. This is an important passage for me, because I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Indeed, I believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ, within the gospel, is found the answer to every human need. Oftentimes I get asked what my perspective is on different situations, whether it is people's interpersonal relationships, whether it's the dynamics in the community, whether it's everything from, from homelessness to poverty to taxation to business policy, what are my opinions on it all? And my opinions don't mean anything because at the end of the day, the only thing that has the power to do anything is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that God became flesh, dwelt among us, died for our sins, and was resurrected, not so that we could continue to have a pitiful, puny, and pathetic life, but that we would be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is all about. But I'm not sure if the modern-day church understands what the gospel is all about and understands the tremendous power that is available to the church each and every moment of each and every day. Because if we did, our lives would be dramatically different. The, uh, earlier today, I saw someone, uh, of course, they, we, we put our drama out on Facebook for the world to see, and I saw someone put on their Facebook post that I'm not sure if God is listening and if God's really there, but it strikes me that from what I know of that person, that person hasn't truly grasped hold of the gospel and taken into what the gospel has to say for their life and actually applying it for their lives. See, I don't know why you're here tonight. Maybe you were here for the great praise music. Maybe you're here because uh, of my wonderful personality and because I'm so handsome to look at. Uh, or maybe you're here because I'm so weird to look at and you just wanted to have something to talk about. But I have to tell you why I'm here tonight before I get started in, the, in this message. Because I have to tell you, after this week, I am thoroughly used up. I'm exhausted. I feel like uh, there's, that, there's a line in Scripture, pour it out like a drink offering. And many times I ask myself, what's the point? Because I look at people do the same thing over and over again, and I give this message, and everybody goes, yeah, amen. And then they go out, and they continue to do the same thing over and over again. And as a pastor, it's not only frustrating, but it's heartbreaking, because 
you care for your flock and you see your flock and you see the people of God just kind of meandering through life and not actually getting anywhere, not actually striving to that heavenward call which Christ is calling us to, not actually doing anything of any real significance because we are so caught up in the tyranny of the mundane in our lives and we don't actually believe at the end of the day that we can take the word of God and apply it and that God is going to be faithful. Because if we believe that, our prayers would be much bigger than our prayers are today. Our actions would be much louder than our actions are today. And our love walk would be much stronger than the love walk that we exhibit today. Amen? Amen. Yes. See, you're not getting it, but that's okay. Because I've got to tell you why I'm here. I'm not here because you're going to get it tonight. But I'm here because I pray that the Holy Spirit will one day get it through our heads and then we will finally get it. And then it will be all worth it, the many stories I've had to tell, the many sermons I've had to preach, the many phone calls I've had to listen to, the Facebook posts I've had to respond to, the emails, the text messaging, and all the stuff, all the different dysfunctions of this world will be worth it if we could one day Get our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen? Amen. And so what I want to talk to you tonight is a problem that is common to each and every one of us. I'm not going to bother asking you for a show of hands on how many people are angry or dealing with angry because I know, or dealing with anger, excuse me, because I know that the majority of Christians are angry Christians. They're angry at somebody. They're angry at something. They're angry at God. They're angry at the circumstances of their life. They just don't understand why. And tonight I want to talk to us about dealing with anger and dealing effectively with anger. Because one thing we need to understand, now I'm not here to tell you tonight that you don't, have, you don't get angry anymore. Because uh, that would just be a waste of my breath. Because we all know that we're going to get angry. It isn't about getting angry. It's about what we do with that anger after that emotion has expressed itself in our lives. So I want to look way back into the beginning. If you want to take out your Bibles, those are those books that are in front of you. Uh, and we're going to look at Genesis 4. So you don't have to go very far. If you don't know the books of the Bible, it's really, real easy. Just go to the first one. And Genesis 4... And I apologize, I left my glasses at home, so uh, you'll just have to deal with me here. But Genesis 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. Now, in interesting, uh, we don't get very far into the creation account and into the beginning of humanity until the dysfunction of humanity exhibits its ugly face. So it's only actually, remember, uh, chapters 1 and 2, creation of the world, chapter 3, fall of mankind, chapter 4, continuation of the after effects of the fall of mankind, and we have Cain and Abel who were born of Adam and Eve. Now, beginning with verse 2, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And two, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right... Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. 
But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. My friends, we see here right in the very beginning the problem with anger. We see that in chapter 3, in the fall of mankind, what led to the fall was the, fall, was the sin of pride. Pride is at the root of every sin. Pride is at the root, my friends, of every problem in your life. Yes, pride is at the root of every issue that we have in our lives. And so then that pride perpetuated into Cain and Abel, and we get this issue where we got brothers, a brother killing another brother. Why? Because sin is crouching at the door, as God said. Those emotions are crouching at the door, and what did God say to them? You must control that sin, you must control that desire, or it will devour you. And we see within this passage the dreadful consequences of sin in a person's life. Sin is not my bad, it's not a whoops. What sin is, is outright rebellion to God. And we need to understand that. We don't just sin, we are rebelling against God and against God's best. And we need to understand something, that God's commandments are not given because God desires to give commandments. God gives the commandments for our benefit, not for his benefit. And so we see not only what happens in the family, in Adam and Eve's family, in Cain and Abel, but we also see the consequences of that anger as Cain is then banned from the Lord's presence there. So what is the problem of anger? First, we need to understand what anger is. Anger is an emotion that ends up getting expressed by our words and our actions. And I'm telling you something, it's like, not like uh, this is going to be an epiphany moment. Uh, that we, oh, yes, my anger gets expressed my, by my words and my uh, actions there. Right? It is an emotion, and it's a natural emotion. It is natural to get mad. It is part of our fleshly desire to get mad. But my friends, it is what we do with that that ends up crossing the line into sin. How we address that anger. My friends, we deal with all kinds of temptations that come our way, don't we? All types of things that pop into our brain great ideas that we have, and how many of us recognize that those great ideas tend to have the devastating consequences in our lives? Because let's face it, we don't know what we don't know, but we think that what we know is everything that we need to know. And at the end of the day, we don't know much of anything at all. So anger left unresolved has devastating consequences in our relationship to God, our relationship to others, and we also need to understand our relationship to ourselves. Because have we ever allowed the anger that we have for other people to control the person that we are? Right? I know people that are angry and they won't go to places because somebody else is there. I know people that are angry, well, I'm not going to talk to that person, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. And I know all these people that what are we doing is we are allowing our anger and we are allowing our emotions to rule our life rather than allowing Christ to rule our life. And Jesus told us something very clearly. A man cannot serve two masters. You are either serving Christ or you are rebelling against him. And if that sounds like a harsh teaching, take it up with the master because that's what it comes down to. Now Cain's anger brought him to the point of killing his brother and being separated from the Lord. Proverbs 29, 22 tells us that a man, a man of wrath stirs up strife and one given to anger causes much transgression. Now what is strife? Well, here's the thing. We, whatever we have, we love to give away, don't we? If you're sick, we love to give our germs away. In fact, we don't have... You don't have to work on getting sick. What do you have to do is work on getting well, right? But we freely give to one another our diseases and our dysfunction. And that's what anger is. It causes strife. What is strife? It is when we sit there and we get other people on ourselves and we all can't get along, right? Because 
It's not good enough for me to be angry if I can spread it with all of you, right? It is my gift to spread it around. But we have to understand that the Bible tells us that strife makers are one of the things that God hates. He hates those who cause strife. He hates the division that it causes there. Because anger spreads and it destroys. And it causes sin to emerge. It perpetuates the lifestyle of sin, the cycle of sin in our lives. So Galatians 5, 19 through 21 tells us that the flesh is prone to fits of anger. And I know that none of you are prone to fits of anger, right? You're not, none of us throw temper tantrums. But all you got to do is look at a child and see that there is not much difference between children and adults. We just throw temper tantrums different ways and with bigger toys, right? But there's not much difference. We throw temper tantrums and then we have to spread it off with our mouth, which the Bible tells us our tongue is a fire that has the ability to destroy. How many of us have seen our words destroy things in our lives? Destroy relationships, destroy friendships, and all those different things. My friends, I know a lot of people, they come to me, and they're church-going people, and they don't have any place to go during the holidays. You know why they don't have any place to go during the holidays? Because they were so concerned with being right that they forgot to do what was right. And they've allowed those relationships to decay over time. And ultimately, my friends, that comes down to that root cause, pride. How should I be treated? How should you talk to me? You know, the other night at the Code Blue facility, uh, some people know, know this story, but I had a churchgoer, not one of our churchgoers, good for you, uh, because you all know better than to talk to me this way, but I had a churchgoer from another church come in and unleash the fury upon me with her words. And uh, I want to tell you, I didn't handle it well. I know, does that surprise you? I did not handle it well. Um, I, at first I said, uh, excuse me, uh, do you know who you're talking to? Who do you think that you're talking to right now? I'm a volunteer and I'm a pastor of this church and you are yelling at me for something that is not in my control. Now, to most of us we would say, well, at least I will say to myself, that that was a rational response. Most people would respond that way. After all, I'm merely sitting here coming in on my time trying to help the homeless, and somebody there is unleashing the fury on me for, nothing, for something that is actually ridiculous and not within my control. What was the result in my life? Well, what was the, re the core of that individual was pride, right? She thought she should know something that she didn't know. She thought she should be able to do something that she wasn't able to do. So that was pride in her life. And then the pride in her life clashed with the pride in my life because I go, who do you think you're talking to? I am the Reverend Dr. Robin Weinstein and you are not going to talk to me that way. Now, I didn't go to that extent because I do have the spirit of self-control partially. So I allowed her to know that I was angry. And what did I do then? I went and told everybody else about it. You don't understand. I just told people at, church, at lunch today. You don't understand how they talk to me, how these people are treating me. What does that all come down to? Pride, right? Because what the Bible tells me about pride is it has to go away. It has to get out of here. It tells me in Philippians, the second chapter, that I am to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. The same mindset who was equal to God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Jesus knew who he was, and he chose to become a servant to all. He chose to allow people to mistreat him. He wasn't a doormat. He was a servant. And my friends, that is how we counter the effects of anger in our life. The consequences of anger, well, strife. So we all can't get along. Bitterness, no one wants to be around someone who's bitter, amen? Amen. Because what the Bible tells us is that bitterness spreads on to everybody else. Because again, it's not good just to be angry if we have to keep it to ourselves. We want to share that joy with everyone else. 
excuse me, dinner came back up. I know a little too much information there. All right, uh, welcome, to, welcome to the church. And the third thing is separation from the Lord's anointing. You know, the interesting thing is the people that come into church Sunday after Sunday, and I'm not sure why they're here. I'm not sure why three-quarters of my congregation is here. I'm not sure why three-quarters of you are here. Because most people will come in and they will hear a message and they'll go, oh, good message, and then they'll leave and go about their day. And they'll just continue operating the same thing. What happens is if we don't, once we hear the truth and we don't apply it, we lose the Lord's anointing on our life. What's the Lord's anointing? It is his power at work in our lives. So when people go, well, I don't understand why it's not working, the first thing we have to do is examine our hearts, examine our attitudes, examine our motives. God is not going to bless your mess. Amen? That's my line that I use all the time. He's not going to bless your mess. And what we sit there and do is we try to, we think that somehow we're going to be able to manipulate God, right? If I put in a couple bucks in the offering plate and I give him a couple hours of my week, somehow God's going to look down and go, Tommy, good job. There you go. Good job. You're, you're good to go, buddy. I'll give you a fresh dose of my anointing. And you, go, you know what, Tommy? You go do whatever you want to do. And just come back here and see me on Sunday and I'll be just pleased as punch. Right? Because God's up there taking attendance. Oh, Nancy's here. Helen's here. Oh, this is so wonderful. Everybody's here. Because let's face it, some of you are here and you're not really here, are you? You're thinking about tomorrow. You're thinking about bed. I'm always thinking about bed. I love bedtime, but I digress. But my friends, when we disobey God... And anger left uncontrolled is disobedience to God. It is sin. It is rebellion. We cut off God's power. Does it mean that God doesn't love you? Absolutely not. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God, not even you. So you can't separate you from the love of God. But what we can do is we can disconnect our life from the power of God that is available to us. And I don't know about you, but if I have the choice of having God feed my soul and give me the energy that I need to do everything to do, or if I can do it myself, I'd rather allow God to do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I tell you, it's tough being up here. So, how do we deal effectively with anger? The cure for anger is one, get over it. That's it. Okay. Get over it. Now, what it tells us in Ephesians 4.26 is, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So what's it say there? It doesn't say don't get angry. In fact, it says be angry. Go ahead, be angry, have your pity party, but don't sin. That means most of the time what we have to do is we have to shut our mouth. Amen? How many of us know that today we could increase our joy by shutting our mouth more often? How many of us know today that we would increase our joy if other people would shut their mouth more often? Amen. All right, right. So the mouth creates problems there. We got to shut our mouth. Be quiet. And do not sin. And now what does this mean? That means I'm sitting here and now I don't have to say anything, but I can believe that I'm saying something, right? You know what I'm talking about here, where I go, well, if they say this, then I'm going to say this. And when they say this, then I'm really going to give it to them there. And then I'm going to say this. And you know what? We have given ourselves a headache for something that will not ever happen. Do those conversations ever go how you have planned it? But you have given yourself a headache. You have stolen your peace. You lay down your own peace there. By going through a situation in your mind that you've actually ended up sinning in that, in that effect. Because you thought about it. You gave it a foothold. And that's what it says here. Don't give a foothold to the devil. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. So therefore, when the anger comes, what's it saying? Deal with it. Deal with it and get over it. And you got to deal with it right away. What we like to do is we... How many of you have seen The Lord of the Rings? Raise your hand. Thank you. All right. And those of you who haven't, I'd like to welcome you to the 21st century. All right, but the Lord of the Rings, uh, who doesn't have 12 hours to watch a trilogy of uh, hobbits? I mean, I don't understand your issue there. But um, 
but there's a scene where they, they go after the ring and, and this golem, this, this little ugly thing, gets the ring and he calls it my precious, right? My precious. And that's how we are with our anger, right? My precious. Yes, I've been wounded. I've been hurt. And we like to talk about it. And we like to think how good we are and how bad they are, right? You know what I'm talking about because I do it at home. Don't you do it? Yes, okay. Welcome to Sinners Anonymous. And let's all recover here. So we got to get over those issues. We got to throw it away and go, really? Really? Who's it hurting? It's only hurting me. It's, like, it's the equivalent of taking a fork and stabbing myself over and over again. Now you would say that's stupid, but isn't that what we do? We take somebody's offense, they offended us, and then over and over and over and over. My family, we would sit there, they would sit there and talk about it over and over, years after the situation happened. And it went from being this big to this big, right? I know none of you are guilty of that. But we as Christians are called to be makers and maintainers of peace. You can't be a maker and maintainer of peace and be angry at the same time. It doesn't work. All right. I know this is not the most popular message, but I will deal with it. The second thing is, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Isn't that a song or something? Or there's some kind of saying, check yourself before you wreck yourself. I don't know. I hear it from the kids. Who would have thought that I would say kids? Okay, but... Um, because in my mind, I'm still one of them. And then I look at myself in the mirror and I go, where'd my hair go? But anyway, check yourself. That is to check your attitude. When you get angry, you need to sit there and go, hmm. Now, what are we doing when we're angry is we're thinking about somebody else, aren't we? We're thinking about they need to do this and they need to do that. And here's what the Christian, the follower of Jesus is supposed to do. Lord, show me the attitude of my heart. And what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond to this situation? Am I in the right here? Because here's what happens. Have you ever been in those arguments that you think that you're right? Men should be used to this, right? You think you're in the right, and then the woman throws something out, and you're ended up on the bottom again? You thought you had the high ground, and you're on the low ground? Men? I guess I'm the only one, okay? But you can be in any of those arguments. I think that I'm right. And somehow I become the aggressor and that other person is the victim. My friends, it's a very fine line there. And we cross that line without even knowing it. And that's why we always have to keep a check on our attitude. Whose job is it to guard their heart? Yours. It's your job to guard your heart. Check your attitude. The third thing is cultivate, cultivate an attitude of meekness. Now, some people look at Christianity as weakness, but actually Christianity is defined by meekness. What is meekness? It is not weakness, but it is power under control. That is, Jesus knew who he was, Jesus knew what he could do, but Jesus chose a different route, right? He didn't chose to choose to blow us all up. That's what I would do. I would blow you all up. Be glad I'm not God. Amen? Amen? All right. But Jesus didn't do that. He chose a different way. My friends, we have to cultivate an attitude of meekness. How do we cultivate an attitude of meekness? Jesus tells us this is how you do it. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will teach you how to live. Jesus teaches us how to live. You have a choice. You can be defined by society, you can be defined by your emotions and other people, or you can be defined by Jesus. There is only one path to true freedom, and that's your choice. And, oh, ah, ah, self-control. Exercise self-control. And you go, well, bless God, I just have to say what I think. No, you don't. Because most of us don't care about what you think. Your opinion is not God's gift to the world. The world went on before your opinion, and it will go on after your opinion. And if we keep our pride in check, we'll be less likely to give our opinion, right? We, some people go, well, I just can't help myself. Anybody ever go, I just can't help myself. I'm getting ready to blow my lid. You know what the Bible tells us is that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love 
and self-control, oh, that means I can actually not do what I feel like doing, not say what I feel like saying. In other words, fake it till you make it. That means it pops up, but I don't have to act on it. I can actually do what Jesus wants me to do by his spirit. Amen? Oh, you guys are pathetic tonight. Amen. I don't like this message. I want a little more joy and peace. Okay, but this is a path to joy and peace. And the la I think this is the last one, but if not, we'll go on to the next one. The last one is do good. See, here's the thing. The devil, when you do good, when someone has done you evil, the devil goes like this. He doesn't understand that, and neither do the other people, right? They go, what do you mean you're doing good? And here's the other thing. Do good anonymously. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. You're like, well, wait a minute. How am I supposed to get the credit? You don't want the credit here. You want the credit up above. You want God to see what you've done in secret out of an act of obedience to him. So I can do good to Barry, not because Barry deserves it, but because I didn't deserve the good that God gave to me, so therefore I'm going to be good to Barry. And you know what? That has a transforming effect. You know what? Barry may never change. Sorry, Barry, I haven't seen you for a while picking on you. Good to see you. Barry may never change. And this is what I tell people in couples counseling all the time, which I hate couples counseling. But because, you know why I hate it? Because they never do what they're supposed to do. I just tell them, get a divorce. It's a lot, you'll save us a lot of time. And they go, you're a pastor, you're not supposed to say that. And I go, well, pay me on the hour, and then I'll tell you what you want to hear. But here's the thing. You do, you might, the other person may never change, but you can. The other person may never be different, but you can. You can be a better person in Christ, and that's your decision. And how do you do it? You do good. And you do good consistently. The Bible tells us that we don't fight evil with evil, but we fight evil with good. We fight evil with good. Be radical in being good and doing good. Do it in secret. Help somebody else. Get yourself off your mind. And it'll be a lot better for you. There you go. God bless you and have a great week. My friends, it's up to us. Do you want to have the life that Jesus died for you to have? Amen? Amen? You want a life characterized by, light, by joy and peace and righteousness? Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I think I want it. You can't live your life like this. I think I want it. You have to go after it with everything you have and everything that you are. And you know what will happen? God will meet you right where you're at. Let us pray. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. 
where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really. <laughs>